This course provides a holistic introduction to unmanned aerial vehicles, more commonly known as UAVs or drones. Throughout the course, you'll be challenged to think deeply about the complexities of software systems needed to operate an autonomous platform. The course begins with an introduction to UAVs. We examine the electrical, software, and aerodynamic characteristics of our platform and discuss the trade-offs involved in building systems suited for a variety of use cases. You will get experience in building and debugging code using our cutting edge robotic software and simulation environment. Building on that knowledge, we'll then venture into the field of computer vision. We'll leverage onboard sensors to process visual cues from the world around our drones. We'll need this to detect and avoid obstacles as well as read QR codes. Underlying all of this is the mathematics of stable flight. We'll dive into a bit of control theory and write code that will be used to guide the UAV towards goals in a challenging environment. All of these topics converge into a single challenge, a race, where each team will have the opportunity to show off what they've learned. Our cutting edge virtual racing environment will challenge you to integrate your knowledge into a fully autonomous system. Get ready. Get set. Go. go. All right, everyone. Welcome this afternoon to the finals of the Autonomous Air Racing course. Um, as we introduced in the video, my name is Nathaniel Hansen, and I was one of the lead instructors, along with my co-part, um, Kendra Concio. We've been, it's been our joy and privilege to lead this course for the past four weeks, um, and to be able to work with all of you to teach just a few things about drones and how they work and how you can do some really cool things with them. So this course has been an absolute joy for all the instructors to teach. It's also been a great challenge in many senses, since in all the past years, this course was taught on campus at MIT. And shifting this course to a virtual environment required some radical rethinking of our curriculum. We had to rethink how this course could be offered in a meaningful and productive way for our students in a virtual environment. And with the assistance of some great uh, teaching staff and teaching assistants, we've been able to make the transition to a course where students had their own drones at homes and were able to have fully exploratory projects exploring what they can do with computer vision and drones. With that being said, I'll hand it over to Kendrick and we can go ahead and start our student presentations. Hi, welcome to our final presentation for the UAV BWSI course. Hi everyone, we are team Totally Tubular Tapas Turtles and we are so excited to be presenting our final project to y'all today. Our project goal is to be able to control our drone and allow it to make specific movements by utilizing various hand signals, such as a palm, a fist, or no hand being shown at all. So hi, my name is Pranavi. My name is Anushka. Hello, I'm Tony. Hi, I'm Akshi. All right, so let's get into the methodology behind our project. In order to achieve our final project goal, we followed a six step plan. Our first step was to create a hand detecting algorithm using some industry level Python code and the media pipe package. We were able to outline major points of the detected hand by using a draw function. Our algorithm was able to differentiate the hand when present from the rest of the environment. This algorithm was the basis for the rest of our code, especially in terms of creating our unique classifiers and helping coordinate drone movement with specific hand signals. Our next step was to create a classifier that could further help distinguish the hand being given to the drone. In order to achieve this, we tackled the problem in two ways. The method we chose to use was machine learning. With existing data sets, we trained a, conv a, a convolutional neural network with a Python package to TensorFlow to predict various hand gestures as they appeared on our drone's camera frame. All right, now we have to translate all that information into you know real world data. Yeah. So um, what we did was we constructed a relatively simple PID controller. Um, and we use the same media pipe package that we did for the hand detection algorithm here as well. Uh, what basically what the code would do is it would use the media pipe package to grab um, a bunch of different landmarks and then from those on the hand and then from those landmarks on the hand, it would grab the specific one right here on the hand. Um, 
<clears throat> that would be the uh, desired state of the robot or of the drone. And then the set state, the current state of the actual drone would be the center of the camera frame. Um, and then the move, and then we'd send, send commands to align the center of the camera frame with the uh, landmark point on your phone. So the FISP ID controller was implemented in a really similar way, except that the set point was used as the center of the fist. <laughs> And um, basically the left and right positions of the drone's camera center and the fist were supposed to be aligned. Lastly, we combined all our code together so that the drone could react to seeing the fist, no hand, and the palm. This allowed us to be able to control our drone with our hands. We can see a demo of this in the last slide. Next slide. So for the hand versus fist size measurements, we had to, um, in a non-machine learning way, the way that we differentiated between the different gestures was that we took on the coordinate grid of the drone's camera, we took the position of the relative points and decided that this was a fist and this was an open palm. And then um, we, in implementing our PID controllers, PID stands for proportional integral derivative. So we had to implement that math into our code so that our drone could know where it should go next. Okay, based on the very uh, reliable statistical method of guessing, we figured that our uh, success rate of our drone was around 7%. Um, some challenges and takeaways we had from this project. Um, well, the first one was, you know, how to solve problems dealing with the difficult tasks. Um, what we did was relatively hard uh, compared to what we did in class. Um, so it was a little bit out of our skill range. We had to come up with effective solutions uh, to whatever problems we got on the fly. Um, combining our work was also a bit of a problem. Uh, we, as like a regular team would, right? Um, we talked about everything, made sure we are all uh, we all understood every single task that was supposed to be completed. Um, then split up everything so that we could maximize productivity. But since you know we're on Zoom. We can't talk to each other in person. Um, combining all the code at the end was a little bit problematic, but it's okay, we got through. Um, and I already mentioned this a little bit, but communication is pretty hard, um, you know, because it's virtual. Uh, Zoom is weird. Texting is difficult. Um, and the drone is kind of weird in the sense that to talk to the drone, to actually run code on it, you have to disconnect yourself from the like World Wide Web and connect to the Wi-Fi network that the drone broadcasts. Um, basically, you can't communicate with anyone while you're actually uh, running the code, um, which was a problem, but we solved it, so it's all okay. Okay, so in the future, we would like to improve our hand detection algorithm to detect more hand signs beyond just the palm, fist, and no hand. We would also like to develop algorithms beyond just tracking the movement of our hand as displayed by our drone. And lastly, we would probably try to tune the PID controller better so that it could respond to up and down, forward and backward movements, as well as like rotation. Um, and that way we could have our drone do more things. Okay, uh, here's a demo. All right, so are we moving on to questions now? Yes. Cool. So our first question going out is, was there anything that you tried to do but weren't able to accomplish? Um, yeah, so for at least for, I was doing um, primarily the FISP PID controller. And um, originally I was gonna have it like, you know, turn based on like um, the speed and like, um, how fast the hand was moving and like the like you know all of the positions up down forward backwards and yaw but like we just didn't have enough time to go through and tune all of those different parts of it so that's why I find primarily focus on like the left and right of it 
Um, so that was one thing that we couldn't really finish accomplishing. Very cool. The second question from our anonymous viewers today is how hard would it be to extend the detection algorithm to use the whole human body for finer gesture control? I'm, pr I'm fairly sure the media pipe package has a um, detection algorithm for the entire body. So um, theoretically it shouldn't be bad, um, but the problem is tuning all the PID controllers for, you know, um, and like actually uh, classifying whatever uh, gesture as whatever um, would be a little bit difficult and time consuming, but yeah, it can be done. Another interesting question from the chat is where else might you see human gestures being used to control drones in the real world? Um, I was personally thinking something like in um, industry manufacturing, um, you could have drones like move big heavy things or not even big heavy things, just things. Um, to whoever's working on whatever, like a machine. Um, you can bring a big block of metal to the machinists and they don't have to go somewhere else. Um, maybe also in the medical field, but I'm, I feel like the downdraft would be a little bit of a problem, so. Very cool. Uh, one other question. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how fine you were able to get the motions of the drone um, able to achieve, for example, like the, the translations and rotations, how, how exact you were able to have the drone be controlled based on the, the palm and fist gestures? I mean, they were pretty exact. There was times when they would go um, just, I guess, if we would have had time to kind of tune it better, then we would have been able to make it, you know, the set point and like the point on our fist to be closer together. But overall, I feel like it was pretty um, exact and matched up with the center point of our camera and like the center point of whatever hand gesture that we had. One other question that we're just getting in from the, uh, the chat right now, this will be our last question, is um, do you wear a tracker device or can these drones be controlled by uh, hand gestures only? Uh, and how would you deal with like different lighting uh, situations and, and different environments? Um, well, we didn't have to wear a tracker device. The media pipe package helped us just, just to use our hands. Um, the lighting conditions were pretty important. I noticed that when I was operating in the darker lightings, it wasn't always able to actually detect my hand, but there are um, parameters that we can put in place for like the minimum tracking confidence and ma maximum tracking confidence so that it's able to detect our hand um, better in certain situations in certain different environments. Awesome, Turtles. Thank you for the great answers. Good job. I think we can move on to the next presentation. So our next team is the vocalists. Hey everyone, welcome to team vocalists. My team, Sakshi, Winston, Sanath and I envisioned a product in which we could establish a whole new level of interaction between humankind and technology. So we did just that. As our final project, we took on the challenge of being able to make voice control drones a reality by implementing natural language processing, which is a subfield of linguistics, computer science, and artificial intelligence. Going into this challenge, none of us really knew what natural language processing was, so we decided to delve deep into it to easily approach this challenge, and we then took what we learned and implemented it which allowed us to voice control drones using simple commands like takeoff and land. We took this forward by having the drone complete multiple advanced commands such as flip and move forward consecutively through voice control. Finally, our drone also has the capability to, to, to detect any given color through voice command. Take a look.
take off. everyone my name is Sanath and I'm one of the team members of the vocalists and today I'm going to talk to you about the logic that we use for our code. To start off for the natural language processing or NLP processor we use a speech recognition module by Google and that will listen for the audio and transcribe it. After listening to the audio uh, the NLP module will transcribe the audio and then send the result to an execution function. After the result has been received by the execution function it, the execution function will then run that result and then send it to the drone, which will, which then will execute the command. Hi, I'll be talking about some discoveries and challenges our group faced in this project. Our challenge number one was having to learn NLP, which means natural language processing. We had to learn this in order to be able to make it possible for the computer to hear audio, interpret it, and convert to text. In general, this was a challenge, especially because of the limited amount of time we were given to learn and implement it, which is why we learned the basics. We ran into an additional problem of having to connect the computer to both the drone and the internet in order to um, access the natural language processing API. So that's why we had to revert to using an ethernet cable. After learning how to use NLP, we had to integrate with the traditional drone commands. Using if else statements, we had to set up a primitive way of distinguishing commands. We programmed it in in such a way that as long as the command had keywords like move and in a certain direction like forward, it would execute the drone command regardless if there were more words in the audio. We had to test out numerous languaging uh, processors because there are so many out there and we had to figure out which one was the best for us. We were divided among two of them, one um, called Google API and the other one named Pocket Sphinx. We decided to use um, Google API just because it was easier to implement and the other um, pocket syncs um, had required too many additional packages and tools. After that, we began to do our first program. We first combined the NLP processor code with the drone commands and executed our first co command program, making the drones take off with our voice. We soon tested out the rest of the commands like move, turn, a certain amount of degrees, or even flip forward and backward. Our next challenge was having to code recursive commands. This means continuously telling the drone commands while it was in the air. Another obstacle we came upon was that the drone landed after 15 seconds by default. And a way to fix this was using the phrase, phrase time limit parameter, where we were able to stop the drone from landing early by waiting for the command. This allowed us to um, keep the drone in the air, listening for our commands, and not land by default. Next, we had moved on to telling the drone to detect colors. We then had to integrate computer vision with the NLP so the drone could track and detect certain colors using its camera. Part of our project was to incorporate color detection with voice commands. For the color detection aspect of this project, we came across many issues. 
First being noise. Noise is anything in the image that is not what you're trying to look at. In this example here, it is anything uh, such as these objects that isn't this green blob. This noise ends up deterring the cameras from focusing on, on what it needs to. So to account for this, we used many of the OpenCV built-in functions. One of these functions was the HSV representation, which we would use along with masking to transform an RGB image to an image that is uh, that would make the what we're trying to focus on white and everything else, aka the noise black. This is what we call a, a binary image. So to do this, we needed to incorporate thresholding into the masking process, which is an image processing method that creates a binary image based on six values of the pixel intensity of the original image. We could find these six values by incorporating a CV2 trackbar, which allowed us to control these six values in real time, which made finding these optimal thresholding values extremely easy. An example of this green, uh, an example of thresholding for the color green is shown here, where you can only see um, the screen blob and the green side of a Rubik's cube in the binary image. Now, to connect our drone to color detection, all we had to do was link um, was use the DJI Telopi stream on function to extract the video feed from the Telodrones. In order to track the color, we needed to find the centroid. So to do this, we iterated through the entire image using two for loops and appended the locations of each white pixel to the pre-made array that we made. We used an if statement to detect if the value of a pixel was a white pixel, uh, since it would return the value 255 if it was white. And with this array, we would just use some simple NumPy commands as well as simple geometry to calculate the centroid of the color. As you can see here, the centroid is represented by pink, and this all works real time as you saw in the demo and you can also switch targets with voice detection also in the demo. And we won't stop working on our project just yet. In the future, we hope to expand the project by having the drone respond to commands instantaneously in real time. Also, we hope to further advance our computer vision algorithm to enable the drone to more easily detect any type of obstacles or objects and circumvent them via voice control. Thank you so much for watching and we hope you enjoyed. Amazing job, guys. So we're going to get into some questions that we're getting in the chat. Uh, the first question, um, does your system require exact phrases to be spoken out loud to execute commands or is a similar phrase uh, going to be okay to have the drone do the same function? Uh, I can answer this one. Um, right now, currently, our code, we program it in such a way that it requires um, keywords such as move. Um, other than that, you can have like any other phrases in it and it, you'll be able to like still, the drone will still execute that command. Uh, how many actions is your drone able to perform? So, so like uh, actions might be able to be performed based off of voice commands. Can you hear me? You did cut up quite a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. The question, can you hear me now? Yeah, kind of. Okay, the, the question is voice control. repeat Giovanni it's how many um, actions can your drone accomplish or how many action primitives did you have for your drone so I can answer this question so we did have quite a few um, different actions that the drone could perform but they were they were like hard-coded so um, we were able to have the drone take off and land and um, after we accomplished that, we then kind of moved to more advanced commands that we could um, have the drone complete um, consecutively. So uh, things like flip, move forward, move backward, move left, move right. Um, so there were lots of basic movements that we were able to have the drone complete through voice command.
Hey. Tierney, can you hear me now? Yeah. Do we have time for one more question or should we move on? Um, if it's a quick run, we can squeeze one in, yeah. Okay, can you guys talk just a little bit about uh, the time delay that you were experiencing with uh, attempting to feed your uh, drone with voice commands and how that affected the performance of the drone? Uh, yeah, I guess I can answer this one. So basically, at first, when we, when we first tried it out, we were experiencing a delay of, of about two to three minutes when we first tried it out. Um, but later, uh, we, we managed to shorten that delay to like a few seconds. What was causing the delay? And how, how did you uh, end up shortening the time? So uh, the cause of the delay was really uh, internet connection speed. Uh, because since, we, since our NLP processor was and internet, uh, it had to be connected to the internet in order to work. Um, I felt like that, we felt like that was probably the cause of the lag in between. Okay, very cool. Uh, I think we can move on to the next presentation then. Yes. All right, thank you so much, the vocalist. Next up, we have Team Invalid IMU. Hey guys, my name is Max with uh, Alex and Tyson, my teammates, and together we're team Invalid IMU, and we're here to share our final project for VivoWorks UAV. So our idea is to have a project that could simulate an environment that UAVs might face in the future. For this simulation, we use the Artex to help our drone with positioning and Arduino powered LEDs to simulate traffic lights. Our desired result was to have the drone position itself in front of the tag and then use the LEDs to signal whether to continue or stop. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, we'll be using. It is a, uh, the DJI Tello drone. It's like a little bigger than my hand, a little bigger than my hand. So our myth methodology uh, for approaching this project, uh, we had to use Aruko markers to like give commands to the drone. Like if it sees this marker, it'll turn right. And we want to make sure that the drone was perfectly in front of the marker. And so we would collect data from, from the drone's camera feed and get things such as like the, such as the centroid, the average side length, and like the slope of the sides for the marker and that would tell us where the drone was so then we would use the a PID controller to then adjust the drone so it would be in front of the marker yeah so after getting the right orientation from the Arco marker um, what we need to do next is read the traffic light um, and this is done using uh, machine learning with the neural network which we'll elaborate on later actually and basically what it does is if it detects that the light is green, the drone will execute the commands based on the ID of the AR tag. And these commands could include uh, anything from turning to moving up or moving down. Um, and this action will bring the next AR tag into view and the process will repeat itself. And here is a video of our results.
Okay, so some challenges that we faced in our project. Uh, so for our traffic light, um, initially we were going to do thresholding, which would isolate a color. So, and we'd compare the sizes of like the mask that we got. So for example, if the green mask was bigger than like the red mask, uh, then we would know that the green light was on, but that didn't really work because the light was pretty much white. And since a, a lot of our rooms were like all, also had like a lot of white in them, uh, any hint of green would get detected and that would like get, that would give us a lot of noise and it really didn't work out. So here's our solution. Yeah, so in order to so solve this problem, rather than using OpenCV to identify the color of the LED, um, instead of we used PyTorch to basically fine tune a pre-trained model called ResNet. Um, and we did this using our own images, um, which we wrote a script to save images from our drone for. And we ended up with actually over 1,500 images. And this led to a very stable classification model. So some future work that we would plan to do if we continued on this project. Uh, one would be roadside detection. Right now we are using Aruko markers and traffic lights. And we would want to replace the Aruko markers with say real life road signs, say like a one way, one -way sign to the right would tell the drone to move to the right. And we also hope to implement machine learning algorithms for human recognition so that the drone could fly at a safe distance and avoid people or even stop for them when going to its destination. Yeah, and with that, um, we'd just like to say thank you very much for listening to our presentation. All right, great job, guys. Uh, jumping right into the first question from our chat. Um, what was the purpose of uh, the marker tags that you were using? And uh, did you consider any other ways of having the drone navigate through your course? Yeah, sure. Um, I can answer this one. So the purpose of the tags was just to like um, allow the drone to orient itself and position itself uh, very exactly in space. Um, and we actually tried doing the same with um, the LEDs using like object detection and a bounding box. But um, basically, the problem we ran into was that um, the the detection model would take too long. Um, so the drone wasn't refreshing at like, um, like at small enough time steps that it would like over, like overreact. So it, yeah, basically it was taking too long. It was too slow. Did you, did you consider any other methods of having the drone navigate through the course? Um, not really. We just felt that air tags would be the most straightforward way to go. So, yeah. All right. Second question from the chat. Was there anything that you learned during this process that you would want to explore further? Okay, I guess I'm the only one responding, but... I felt like, um, especially machine learning, uh, like uh, like computer vision were like really interesting, um, like kind of areas to get into. And we kind of only scratched the surface with like a very basic classification model. But if we wanted to go further into like road sign detection, um, like it, it'd just be really interesting to see how how to get that to work, you know. Another question we have, uh, you mentioned uh, PID control earlier. Were there any um, techniques or strategies that you used to tune your PID controller to have more accurate uh, positioning for your drone? Uh, I'll take this question. Oh, okay, so, okay, so we do it. We, we really just uh, use uh, uh, trial and error. I would say, you know, we, we uh, set, a, set a number and we try it out, and if it doesn't 
Uh, sorry, Pearson, I think um, you might have cut out. Can you hear us? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. I guess I'll just like I'll just like kind of finish what she was saying. We we pretty much we pretty much just it's we started with like a guest check kind of thing and then like we just, we just narrowed it down and just went into just narrowed it down and just went in the direction. If it was like too little, then we'd just like make the number bigger. And then if and then if the other numbers like if the P was if the P was really like our D didn't really match that, then we make the D bigger. And so it's just and so it's just trial and error. I, yeah. Okay, cool. That's time for uh, questions for your group. Thank you so much for presenting. Awesome job. We'll move to the next presentation. Next up, we have the aptly named Unidentified Crashing Objects. Hi, I'm Reed. Uh, and I'm Zafan, and uh, we're a team on Unidentified Crashing Objects from the UAB course. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about our methodology. So our project idea was uh, for was drone racing, which we simplified to just flying through hoops in a path. And we wanted to focus on planning our path through the hoops, then following that path. We split the task up into four parts, image processing, odometry, path planning, and path following. Uh, so first, to be able to do the path planning and the following, a lot, of the, a lot of information from the environment is needed. Uh, that involves knowing where the rings are and knowing where the drone is. Uh, we decided to use Aruka markers, as you can see on the image on the right, on top of the rings. Uh, we wanted to spend more time focusing on path planning and track uh, following rather than trying to identify the Aruka markers uh, straight from the image feed, which we tried a little bit for. Uh, we used OpenCV's solve PNP function to find out the translation vectors of where the hoop is in the 3D coordinates. Um, so once we have those, we start where the drone originally is and we mark those as zero, zero, zero. And we find out where the markers are relative to that. And then if the drone moves, we compare where the drone thinks the Aruka marker is right now to where it was originally to find the drone's location. And we apply a similar principle to finding if we find a new uh, ring, we compare uh, where the drone thinks it is, and we add it to the amount of where the drone's position is relative to other markers to figure out where the new ring is. Once we could localize ourselves, we needed to plan our paths. We decided to use SciPy's built-in cubic spline function because it allowed us to create a smooth path and let us set the tangent values at every control point. Essentially, this meant that the drone would always fly through the hoops exactly normal to the hoop plane. One challenge with this is that the cubic spline class only works in two dimensions. To fix this, we just made two splines, each in two, two dimensions, then combined them to create one three-dimensional path. Then, to follow the path, there were three steps. First, we converted the, sp the spline object into a list of lots of points in 3D space. Then, we chose a point a certain distance in front of the drone, and then flew towards that point. As the drone moves, this target moves up the path as well, so the drone follows the path. This was the part that we had the most trouble with throughout the, po throughout the project. Finally, the drone needs to finish the path. This is because when it gets close to the ring, the drone can no longer see the markers because the field of view is limited. At this point, it temporarily gives up on odometry and the nice, and the nice path, and it just goes forward for a short distance. This is tricky because if the drone is not lined up correctly, or if it has some momentum in another direction, this can cause it to hit the ring instead of going through it because it is flying in open loop control. This combined with the substantial lag from the computation and Wi-Fi connection caused this to be a challenging point of path following. Uh, so next are results. Uh, we stayed true to our name uh, with several crashes. This is an example of one. Uh, we were still kind of messing around with how to convert values from path following to uh, the drone's controls. And uh, the values are a little bit too high here.
now we have a demo flight and so on the left we have a video of the the drone's point of view as it's flying and this is just the beginning of a flight and you can see that we have plotted on top exactly where the markers are and the center of the hoop so that's how it knows where it is and those track with those markers and then on the right we have a short video because and this is of the drone trying to fly through the hoop but as you can see when it gets too close it can't see anymore so that's what we were talking about earlier how it causes it to crash into the hoop if it's too close and can't see so this part is unreliable but it does work a little so now we have some challenges that we ran into so first we encountered non-standard space definitions so basically the outputs of the functions that we use for odometry had different formats of describing space as the inputs of the function that controlled the drone and these were both different from what we were thinking for example we'd think that x meant forward y meant sideways and z meant up while the code would think something else this issue was hard to fix because it was hard to communicate what we meant to each other and because it was hard to visualize. Second, path following was another big challenge. This was mostly a result of, of the different definitions of space because path the path following function had to deal with all the different definitions and produce something from those that made sense. The visualization difficulties made this function extra hard to debug. Finally, we had challenges with computation. Our computers weren't fast enough to run all the code we wanted to. In order to combat this, we optimized our code by minimizing the number of times we iterated through long lists, implemented threading to let multiple loops run concurrently, and utilized just-in-time compiling to compile certain functions in order to make them run faster. Uh, so in the future, we have several improvement plans if we were to continue the project. And one of them is detecting the ring without using Aruka markers. Uh, you can use that either by using image filtering or color filtering and contouring. We also wanted to integrate rotation. Uh, we only use translation, so up, down, left, right, uh, forward, back. And we wanted to use rotation to have the drone yaw towards a marker. And that would let us do loops around like a full track or several other things. We also wanted to uh, include multiple rings. Uh, it was original plan to, but we ran into some problems along the way as we just went over that only let us go through one ring at the end. OK, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, we'd love to answer them. Amazing presentation, Reed and Zafan. That was a very impressive project that you guys were working on. You mentioned some of your challenges that you faced along the way. Can you uh, please elaborate on which challenge you think was the most significant? And maybe tell us a little bit about your engineering approach that you used to try to solve uh, the solution for that problem. Yeah, OK. So I think for us, the biggest problem was the path following function, because um, like we talked about in the video, it was hard to visualize uh, what was happening in the function. So when we applied debugging techniques, like we did in all other functions, by stepping through the function step by step to see what was happening, it was just harder to think about. And additionally, we had to work together on that. And that was hard because we might be visualizing it in a different way from each other as well. So that was difficult. Very cool. Another question that we're getting from our chat from an anonymous uh, viewer is um, why use open loop control instead of closed loop control? Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, okay, yeah. So we actually were using closed loop control, but it was just when we were too close to the ring that we switched to open loop because once you get close, there were two markers on either side of the ring. But if, you, if the camera is too close to the ring, it just can't see those anymore because the field of view of the camera is limited. So we just, at the end, fly forward for a straight amount because there's no other way to track where we are. 
And that's to just get you through the hoop, right? Yeah. Cool. Another question. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the margin of error is uh, on your path planning algorithm? Um, I don't know the exact amount, but the path planning algorithm is pretty accurate with those splines uh, because we knew pretty definitively where everything was. It was mostly the error came from uh, dometry, where it was a little bit inaccurate from the distance and the drone kind of moving around and not staying perfectly stable and also the path following. Did you find that the uh, solve PNP function to to find the pose of your markers was pretty accurate in helping you uh, define your paths. Oh yeah, it was fairly accurate, but especially when you are pretty close to the center, uh, the values keep moving side to side. So the drone keeps moving left and right, left and right. Cool, uh, yeah, just one more question real quick. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the future of just-in-time compiling for you guys? Okay, yeah, this was just kind of one thing that we implemented to save computation time. So it would be nice to apply to other functions because right now we were getting less than like 30 frames per second. I think we were around 15. So if we applied that to more functions, it would be faster. However, the current technology is limited as to what built-in functions or parts of NumPy or OpenCV that it supports. So there are other easier ways to uh, speed up our code, such as NumPy vectorization or uh, allowing the use of GPU for image processing. So just-in-time compiling was mostly a quick fix that happened that actually worked for one subset of our program. Awesome, readings and fun. Again, very impressive presentation. Great job, guys. We'll move on to the next presentation now. Next, we have Team Celeritas. Oh, and thank you so much for coming in this morning. Um, myself and my partner, Vaibhavi, have been working very diligently in the Autonomous Drone Racing course to present to you Celeritas. Effectively, what Solaritas is, is an application that allows drones to, or teledrones, to autonomously navigate, chart, and race in your own custom-made obstacle courses using Eruco tags, which are basically just like, like, AR, QR tags that the drone scans to figure out where it is. And the application does so using localization, path planning, and controls, which my partner will explain. So Celeritas implements, implements localization in the form of visual odometry. So the algorithm plots features um, in an image uh, that is captured by the camera while the drone is uh, going on its path. It tracks the position in three dimensions using position relative to the points in the image. And uh, essentially it allows dr the drone to determine its position in the race uh, or the obstacle course. Um, path planning. So. We originally initially experimented with shortest path algorithms like Dijkstra's, but realized that would be more optimal for something like a maze while we simply had a race course. So uh, we abandoned that to write our own algorithm in a way, um, it, which utilizes visual odometry, the network graph, which is uh, outputted by the visual odometry to plot the path. So the program uses the current coordinates of the drone and the destination marker coordinates. So the marker, the coordinates of the marker, which uh, which represents the ending of that leg of the flight. Um, both are extracted from the uh, network graph. Uh, and then we also utilized uh, PID loops to steadily navigate to the target. Um, this along with rudimentary obstacle detection and avoidance will be elaborated a little bit further uh, in the next slide. So in terms of controls, just to elaborate a little bit more on that, we primarily used proportional PID for the, each leg of the journey. So. The entire journey is marked by several Aruga tags along the way, and uh, it, the algorithm it focuses just on one leg, so from one from the start Aruga marker to the destination Aruga marker, and that's repeated until the course is finished. Um, so in order to 
make sure that we were constantly sticking to a correct path, we implemented something uh, calculating the slope. So um, the drone will take the coordinates, the, the algorithm will take the coordinates of the drone, the current coordinates, as well as the um, destination markers coordinates extracted from the network graph, uh, which comes from visual odometry. Um, and then it will calculate the slope constantly, constantly calculate the slope and constantly be made to stick to that line, stick to that slope using proportional uh, controls until it detects a Aruka marker. So uh, an Aruka marker could either represent an obstacle or it could represent a actual destination. So the way the drone distinguishes between those is the IDs of the Aruka markers. So uh, say uh, obstacles will have a, uh, a um, unique Aruka marker ID, so seven or nine or something, and the destination will have a separate unique ID marker. And um, the obstacle uh, could, there could be many different obstacles and those could each have a different uh, ID and thus the drone could plan its path accordingly. Say it comes across a seven, that could be a box. It would have to do something else to uh, circumnavigate that. But then it comes across a nine, that could be a pool noodle or something and it has to do something else to navigate that. But then once it comes to the destination markers ID, it will recognize that and then uh, re-implement the algorithm to go on the next leg of its journey. Um, this way, uh, even when a, an obstacle comes along, it only has to uh, slightly deviate from its trajectory uh, and then it comes straight back to the correct trajectory and thus can keep on going to the final destination. Some key takeaways that I feel that we've both internalized over the course of this um, program. Trial and error is pretty efficient in some cases. Oftentimes we try to um, or we look at methods such as trial and error as more beneath us, where in reality, it's probably the most efficient way to tackle an issue in a certain case scenario. And also, we all, we've learned to ask around. That's definitely something that's come up as we've done countless hours of debugging over this past week. And just asking, you know, like no matter if you, whether or not you think someone has the expertise or the ability to solve the problem, just ask for input, get an alternate perspective. You never know how it might help. And lastly, and most importantly to me at least, is that you have to break down a little bit to rebuild stronger. And I feel like this project has definitely broken me down in bits and pieces, but I've come out of it now feeling better than ever and so much more capable than I did coming into it. And without further ado, present our final product. Life can bring much pain. There are many ways to deal with this pain. Choose wisely. Okay, so update on that previous notice. It is now approximately five hours later, 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here in New York, New York. I've encountered a few errors, to say the least, and my incredible instructors, Kendrick and Nathaniel, have been just so willing to help and have been like really the sole reason I've survived this long. And with their help, I am proud, just so, so proud to present Celeritas. Will I fall? Will I fly? Heal my soul, fulfill my heart. Cross my heart and hope to die. With my smile, no devil's Count it up, count it up, count it up, count it, count it up, count it up, count it up. Count it, count it up, count it up, count it up, count it. Count it up, count it up, count it up, count it, count it up.
Very cool, Stefan and Vaibhavi. Great job. Amazing presentation. We have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, first question, um, how did you come to your decision to use uh, visual odometry? And um, did you perhaps, uh, I guess, like consider a monocular SLAM algorithm as like an alternative method of of uh, finding the course? Uh, yeah, I guess I can take this one. Um, though we divvied up the work, I was primarily focused on the localization or basically just be, um, getting the drone to figure out where it is at any given time. And SLAM was definitely the first method we looked into. It was by far like for, like for our uses, just the most optimal thing we could use. And, you know, we were like super into it. We were like, wow, this thing is awesome. They use this in like missile technology. There was a Python library available for it. And then we tried to implement it in our code. And I don't think there is like anything I've done coding wise that was more difficult in my life. So we ended up just referring back to visual odometry, which is a little less efficient, but for what we were doing, it worked perfectly fine and it was able to get the job done. Very cool. That sounds like it might have been uh, one of the tougher challenges that you experienced, but maybe um, could one of you elaborate on what you think was the, the most difficult challenge that you experienced and maybe one of your engineering approaches that you took to solve your, your problem? Um, I guess I can go. Um, as you saw in the video, I was up in the early hours just debugging with Nathaniel and Kendrick. Um, the big issue we had was because for our obstacle course, we wanted everything to like run in real time and be very efficient, of course, because it's racing in theory. So we um, there was like it's just like a big loop of so much code, and just like libraries upon libraries, on dependencies upon dependencies. So like. If like one line was wrong, we had to go through like four different files and three different documentation sites to try and figure out what was wrong. So that was definitely difficult and where I chose to exercise a lot of trial and error. So I think um, that's that's honestly where I gained appreciation for just trying things out and seeing if it works. Very cool by Bobby and Stefan coming out of this project as debugging kings. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, so that was our last question, but thank you very much for a very impressive presentation. We can move on to our next one now. Good job, guys. Excellent job. And continuing on, we have the missing propellers. Hello, we are team Missing Propellers from the BWSI UAV course. I'm Michelle. My name is KG. And my name is Nandini. For our final challenge, we decided to make our drones fly through an obstacle course autonomously. We made the course using pool noodles and lots and lots of tape. We created hoops for the drone using blue, green, and orange pool noodles. These colors are easy to recognize using OpenCV color thresholding functions. We draw contours around areas of the image that have the desired color, then fit an ellipse to the contour that encloses the largest area. In this picture, a blue lamp's contour is detected. But it is not mistaken as a hoop because its area is smaller. As demonstrated in the video, our code can draw an ellipse with adequate accuracy even when the hoop is partially obscured. On the hoop relative position and orientation using OpenCV solve PMP function. This function returns a translation vector with distances in the x, y, and z directions, as well as a rotation matrix. We converted the rotation matrix into Euler angles and used those to help determine the hoop relative yaw angle from the drone. Our centering process features four proportional integral derivative, or PID, controllers. The derivative term counters overshooting by lowering the speed of the drone as it approaches the center. 
and the integral term reduces steady state error by slowly increasing speed over time. Tuning the PID constraints is very important because the drone's velocity should be as small as possible when it reaches the center of the hoop. We use four PID controllers in our alignment process. Our code makes decisions using a finite state machine. The first state is searching for the hoop by rotating in place at a specified height. Once the hoop is found, the program switches to the second state, where the drone lines up with the hoop. This is where the most adjustments are made. After aligning with the hoop, the drone moves to the third state, where it flies forward while making minor adjustments only. Once the drone can no longer see the hoop, it flies forward for a little longer in the fourth state. At this point, the drone returns to the first state and starts searching for the next color of hoop. Like any project, we had a lot more mistakes than successes. Some of them were silly, like wearing the same color shirt as the hoop we were looking for. This sometimes caused the drone to fly straight at us instead. Others were more difficult. We had a lot of problems with the drone crashing into the hoop because its yaw angle was overshooting. We realized that it was very difficult to learn from our mistakes when our drone crashed suddenly. We enhanced the camera feed with live updates of variables and recorded the entire flight from the drone's point of view. This allowed us to go over the flight after the crash in detail and figure out exactly what went wrong. In this case, it looks like our PID needs some tuning. The source of the overshooting yaw problem is that the yaw angle is always positive. This is because hoops at opposite angles result in identical ellipses. If the angles were always positive, the drone would only rotate in one direction. To solve this problem, we kept track of a set of past yaw angles and found the average rate of change of the set. If the rate of change is positive, the drone is getting farther from the correct yaw, so we switched science on the angle to have the drone rotate in the opposite direction. This not only allows us to rotate in both directions, but it also allows the drone to correct any overshoot. While we didn't have time to do this, the next improvement for us would be to program the drone to fly through hoops at any pitch. We already have accurate pitch information, but we would need to write an algorithm that keeps the hoop in frame while flying high enough to be able to go through the hoop at an angle. This would allow us to go up and down stairs and take on more complex obstacle courses.
All right, amazing presentation by Team Missing Propellers. We have a couple questions coming in from the chat. Um, first one, can you talk a little bit about your choice to use a state machine to model your drone's decision making? I can answer this one. Um, so the state machine, so the first, when we realized we needed a state machine, uh, because the, as the drone approaches a hoop, when it gets close to the hoop, you actually see the, you either see just a corner of the hoop, you don't see the entire hoop because the uh, field of view is limited. So you actually want to adjust your, um, how much your drone aligns as it gets closer because your, your uh, things aren't as accurate. And you also eventually lose sight of the hoop and you want to keep flying so you get through the hoop. So there are a bunch, and when you don't see any hoops, you want it to search around to look for a hoop so it doesn't get lost. So there are a bunch of different procedures we have to do and having a state machine makes it us able to switch through them reliably. Kind of going off of that same question, can you talk a little bit about the functionality that you've implemented for the state that is uh, used to find the additional hoops after going through the previous hoop that you that you go through in the course, like when you find the next hoop? Yeah, so right now the find hoop, the drone just spins around in place because we have the course set in a way that the drone can always see the next hoop if it spins in place. So it doesn't need to go up or down. So just letting it spin in place lets it see if it maybe like bounced off something like you saw in the video. So this keeps it more resilient, but we also don't have the course so crazy that it like has to go all over to find the hoop. Amazing. Also, uh, we're almost out of time, but one last question. Nandini, did you design the, uh, the sound for the intro of your video? Yes, I did. That was really cool. Good job. Thank you. All right. Amazing presentation, guys. Very impressive. Uh, moving on to the next presentation. Pump fake. Resets no for way. three. What a shot. And Jordan and one. That was crazy. Let's go, Warriors. Have you ever found yourself sitting and watching a basketball game and then wanting to get out on the court and creating a video of yourself playing too? But your parents are at work and you want to capture cool basketball footage of you playing. Wouldn't it be nice to have an unmanned camera that follows the basketball at your disposal? Introducing Sports Drone. With our Sports Drone program, you can create sports footage right in your own backyard. I'm Garvey. I'm Aiden. I'm Andy. And I'm Christian. And we're the Vision Chase Ballers. So we decided to focus our sports show on one sport, basketball. The objective of this project was to be able to use a DJI teledrone to autonomously track a basketball as it's being dribbled and thrown in different areas of the court while having the drone stay on the sidelines and moving back and forth and up and down as needed. We wanted to record this movement using the drone so it could also be used to make game footage in the future. So as you'll see with these next few slides, we took a wide variety of approaches in detecting basketballs in order to find the best one and perfect it. One method we attempted is object detection using a machine learning model trained on the COCO data set, which is a massive collection of everyday objects. We would have liked to use a data set trained specifically on basketballs, but we didn't have the time to train one ourselves. And we also needed extreme efficiency in order for the model to keep up with the frames of the camera. Thus, we used Google's mobile net model Named so because it was built to be run on phones, which have limited performance, so it's extremely efficient and fit our needs for fast, constant speeds. As with the code for our other features, we first ensured that it worked with images before implementing them on videos and the drone's camera stream. And although it worked great with close-up pictures, the model struggled to find basketballs at a distance. And because our drone is always on the sidelines of the court, it always will be at quite a distance from the basketball. So we decided against the object detection method because of its weakness in long distances. For our next uh, basketball detection method, we used contour detection. And basically that means we pass a color filter used specified in HSV, which is hue, saturation, and value, also called brightness, over the frames of the camera so that only orange was allowed through. On the left, you can see our initial filter, which didn't cover all the hues and brightnesses of the basketball 
But on the right, after we were able to properly tune it, we could cover the whole ball. And after the frame passes through this color filter, the frame becomes a black and white image where the white is orange and everything else is black. And we ran OpenCV's contour detection on it to find the edges of the black and white and thus highlight the ball. Although it worked great in backgrounds without any other orange, unfortunately, basketball courts and most other everyday backgrounds have orange in them, leading other things to be highlighted, highlighted as well. And we decided to stick with this method because it worked well in a wide variety of circumstances. And if we could just implement other features, as we'll see in a second, then we could get rid of the anything else that was orange, but not the basketball. So another method we experimented with was detecting specific shapes present in the frame, and in this case, detecting circles. To do this, to do this we utilize OpenCV's function, as shown here, and we use this program by first converting the frame from BGR, or blue, green, and red, to grayscale, and then slightly blurring the image, allowing for the reduction of any noise present. Given certain parameters, you, we used this to define the ranges in which the circles will be present. And we were able to detect the circles and receive an output with the outline and the center of the circle as shown in the picture to the right. In addition, we implemented a ball estimator that estimates the ball's position even when it temporarily goes out of frame. By keeping track of the ball's uh, most previously known position, as well as its relative velocity across the screen, we can make good estimates on where the ball is. To control the drone, we have three separate PID control loops running on three degrees of motion to keep the ball in frame. One controls the drone's left to right motion, and one controls the up and down motion. And finally, we have a third controller that moves the drone forwards or backwards if the ball gets too far or too close. Uh, so while writing the code for this drone, we ran into many different challenges. Uh, for example, when working with the contour detection, we noticed that the lower portion of the ball was covered by its own shadow, which disrupted the contour detector. This and finding the closest color threshold was subjective in some ways, but after many tries, we were able to obtain pretty accurate values. In addition, we tried to have the drone continue to move in the same direction if the ball moved out of frame. All right, so here's a video of our sports drone at work. In this first clip, uh, you can see our first approach at this, which was using contour detection, as we talked about with the HSV color filtering, to select only the orange in the frame, then detecting the contours of the frame while ignoring the tiny contours whose areas were too small. And after that, we were able to limit the possible contours down to a few, and to find our best guess at the basketball, we averaged the centers of all those contours. Uh, and you'll see the contours are highlighted in green, and then the estimated position is in blue. So the problem with this is that it's just finding an average. You don't know and it's where the, exactly the basketball is. And it's often like in the middle, in between two big contours. Unfortunately, the big contour is in this case, not the ball. And this is our next, uh, for these next few clips, we implemented the shape detection Garvey talked about. And also the fact that the basketball's position shouldn't be jumping around the frame. So we limited the possible contours to only the ones close to the last known position. We also added a shot attempt counter by using the last known height, by, by using the estimated height of the ball, given how close it is to the drone, its position in the frame, and the known height of the tele. And in this, you can kind of see the inner workings of it. Here on the left is basically all those contours we talked about. And the green, the, yeah, the white is all the contours, and the green ones are the ones that are possible candidates based on its last known location. In the future, we hope that this program, program can be used and adapted to be able to determine if a ball or player is in or out of bounds and can assist referees with tricky decisions. In addition, we can use contour and object detection to identify when the ball and if the ball goes in the basket, allowing us to keep a uh, better track of the score and attempted shots. And of course, this program, this program can be adapted to track soccer balls, frisbees, and many other equipment. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, guys, another fantastic project. Uh, we have a couple more uh, questions coming in in the chat and uh, a little bit of time to answer those, hopefully. Let's so our, our actually, first question. Sorry to interrupt. Let's actually skip because the uh, webinar ends in one minute. So we'd like to wrap up and say a couple of things. Got it. Uh, sorry, we don't have time for questions for the last group. It was such 
so many great presentations today. I'm blown away um, by everything that you've accomplished in such a short period of time. Um, you've worked through some real adversity and be able to take uh, a real drone and do something cool with it. We say in robotics that the first rule is, first law of robotics is that nothing works. And I know some of you struggled with that, but in the end, you all ended up with something really cool and some tangible engineering that I hope that you take some great lessons from. So it has been my absolute joy and pleasure to be your lead instructor for the course. Um, Kendrick, do you have some words? I'm just absolutely so proud of all of you. Um, and you should be proud of yourselves. So um, yeah. <laughs> Amazing job, guys. Stellar presentations. Amazing. Amazing. So with that said, I think we are at the end of our last time together as a class. Um, so thank you so much for all of your time and attention this summer. I hope you learned a thing or two. Um, and go forth and do great things. We're looking forward to, we want to see those things in the future.